to, to moderate, I suppose, uh, this panel discussion, which is a part of the Grow Your Art residency. This is a collaboration between NEC's Entrepreneurial Musicianship Department and the Jazz Studies Department. I'd also like to thank Olivia Porata, who I think is here, and Laura Reyes, <coughs> both of whom did a lot of work to organize this week. Um, today we're going to hear about the experiences of five distinguished female identifying participants here, active in the music world. And I hope we have some time at the end for questions. Um, I'd like to start by asking each of our participants, I'll briefly introduce them, uh, starting next to the uh, NEC alum and Berkeley faculty member, Einan Serto. Uh, <laughs> uh, also an NEC alum and, NEC and faculty member, Dominique Eid. Uh, vi visiting artist, Cecile McLuhan Salmon. Okay, this is the toughest one. NEC's Director of Cultural Equity and Belonging, Monique von Willig. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, NEC's President, Andrea Kalin. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'd like to say more about your story, uh, feel free. But I also would like to ask a sort of initial question, and, and that is, um, what, is what, what is one of your significant strengths as a female identifying leader in your field? I know you're in slightly different areas. And how has that strength been an asset to you in getting you where you are today? And maybe we'll just start, we'll mix it up, but fine. <laughs> do, you, do you feel comfortable answering that first one? And, and tell us a little bit more about yourself if you want. Okay. Um, so, in my, what was the question? <laughs> so, your strength, okay. or one, at least one strength, and how has that helped you, or how has that been an asset to you in your, in your career? Well, um, for me, it, there are two things, actually. Um, uh, being a female faculty member um, over at Berkeley, um, particularly in jazz composition. Um, I was the first woman hired in that department um, with this long history. So um, what we started seeing was really interesting. And I felt like I was seeing a lot of female students actually looking up to me and then um, having to um, organize like uh, Sam Spear, who is an NEC alum. She also organized the Women in Jazz Collective. Um, we were just talking about being aware of um, more women within our field. And then the other thing is um, being a jazz composer. And I write for big band, really large band. And it was just sort of something that was a little bit more unique. And I felt like um, that was just something that was some, you know, that's a strength to me. So Great. I don't know if you want me to elaborate more. No, no, that's <laughs> fine. We have lots of other questions. So Dominique, do you wanna tackle that one? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. We did get some of these questions in advance, and the fact is I wouldn't know what it would be like to not be a female <laughs> <laughs> artist. So I don't know, you know, what the strength of, the particular strength of that is. I don't know that I would associate it particularly with my gender, but I would say humor, for sure is very helpful, but humor kind of based on noticing and perception and asking lots of questions. I was the youngest of five. Um, I'm always still a bit surprised to be eating at the big people's table <laughs> at age 63. It's still like, wow. So, um, so I'm just watching and looking and, and questioning why, if somebody says this is an avoid note, why? If somebody says, Singing without vibrato isn't natural. I say, why? You know, this has been ongoing for me, um, you know, in, in all my studies. Um, and I feel like that's helped me both learn a lot more because sometimes there's really good answers as to why and sometimes there aren't very good answers to why. And then you can put things together for yourself. So. All right. Cecile. 
Uh, I would say, on a similar line, probably my curiosity and um, I, I just remember early on, uh, I don't know if this is so much a strength, but uh, I think I was 13, I was in middle school, my sister, my big sister had to sit me down and say, I, I see how, how hard you're trying to fit in mm -hmm. and trying to like be in with the cool kids or whatever, and she's like, you're not cool, you're weird. Mm -hmm and go towards that and, and really pursue everything that makes you, like all your little idiosyncrasies. So I think, I think the pursuit of my idiosyncrasies and of my curiosity are two of my strengths, maybe. And my self-deprecation too is a strength. This is a strength <laughs> to take the mic out of the holder. <laughs> so I think um, my biggest strength, um, because I'm South African, I'm a woman of color, you know, I'm an immigrant to this country. I think there's been many moments where I've had to be really brave, whether it's been as a performer and then moving into administration. And so I've always seen my biggest strength has been the person in the room that might say the things that no one else is willing to say in that moment. But how that has really grown is that Maybe 10 years ago, I'd be the person in the room roaring, you know, as a lion. The lion is my favorite animal. But how that's really grown is to really wrap that in empathy. And so that's been two of my biggest senses, to be fully candid as much as I can, but really consider those in the room um, when sharing those things. And I've, I've realized that embodying both of do those has opened doors for me, but also helped me move change forward. So that would be mine. Uh, yeah, I, I find this all very inspiring. I don't, I don't know if I would consider these strengths. They just simply are facts of who I am. So, you know, you, you work with what you've got. Um, I, I think uh, increasingly during COVID, I would say sort of persistence um, uh, and um, a kind of optimism, sort of what I, I hope is a grounded optimism. I mean, I believe really strongly in what we're doing. And so that's the thing that sort of keeps me going. And tied to that, I think, is, is just... Um, a sense of responsibility. I think that that's the thing that drives me. I believe, you know, when you believe something, when you care about something, when you have a responsibility to it and to the people around it, um, then the persistence and the optimism sort of flow from that. So it's sort of all tied in with that driver of responsibility, I think. Great. So as you probably know, grow your art, this resident, or this sort of residency that we're in the middle of addresses both music and business. Um, so my question is, in the business side of your professional lives, uh, can you discuss a few of the biggest challenges that you've faced in the world of could be jazz or music or music administration? Um, maybe Andrea, would you feel comfortable? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so many, so many. I mean, the obvious one I'm going to say is COVID, right? Um, the, the weekend that we sent everybody home um, in, you know, March 13th, 2020, uh, was also the day my cat died. <laughs> so it was a, it started out that way and it kind of ended up. Um, but no, when we sent everybody home, I, I, you know, I went home that weekend and I thought, okay, so I've always believed in music. I've always believed in the power of music. I've always believed in the work that we do, even you know, if it's not supposedly sort of lucrative or, or reasonable or rational, all those sorts of things. And I went home and thought, okay, is this the thing that does us in? Like, is this it? All the things that we think we can do we can't do anymore. Um, and that, that really, and, and the way that we do our work together was not a thing. So there was no intuitive sense of what was going on. Everybody was living different experiences, living this shared experience in different ways. Um, and that I think required me to pull on everything um, that I had learned professionally. Um, you had to listen in new ways. You had to um, communicate in new and more ways. You had to think in different ways. You had to dig into hope and responsibility and purpose and reimagine and be curious and all of those things. So I, I think that, you know, for me is sort of the pressing challenge um, and make sure that everybody else was, was uh, able to come along on that too. So, yeah. Monique, do you want to add to that? Sure, I can jump in. 
So for me, I think it, it, it would be moments like COVID or um, the recent racial justice movement around Black Lives Matter, the Me Too movement, uh, Stop Asian Hate movements. I think in these moments when I've been in leadership realms, in my own realms, it, it's, it's often been about balancing the macro and the micro, and the micro might be my own values. What are my own values around this, this issue, this topic? What do I feel about it? And then how do I hold space for the people around me, the people on, on a team that I'm on or the students that I'm working with? What does it look like to hold space in ways that are safe and brave? And then still thinking about the vision and moving that forward. So I found that sometimes a challenge and holding onto your values. If you hold on to nothing, how can I hold on to my values in this moment? And sometimes that means me keeping quiet. Sometimes that means me speaking. Sometimes that means me speaking out and just figuring out what it is, what does this moment require of me? And that's been a challenge. It took me years to learn. There's a moment in front of me. I could do many things in this moment, but what is this moment asking of me and how will that impact everyone who are in my circles? Um, I, would, I would say, of course, uh, this present moment is a big challenge. Um, but I think zooming out a little bit uh, or stepping a little bit away from it. Um, some of the biggest challenges have been personal challenges, um, you know, continuing on after like in the midst of tragedies, personal tragedies, deaths, um, trying to keep, keep going when either the mind or uh, people around me are, are, you know, in extremely precarious situations. Um, and I guess on a, maybe on a lighter note, um, a big challenge, I've been trying to make a movie for the last couple years. Um, and there have been, I don't know how many meetings, how many pitch meetings and getting excitement from people in the meetings and then getting no's every time. No, 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 we're not. Oh, it's amazing, we're not interested, we're not interested. For years um, is actually a challenge that now has turned into something that I am very grateful for because every time I get a no, it makes me feel stronger and more empowered to continue and um, gives me thicker skin, so. I would say those. Um, I, I'm so curious about your movie. <laughs> I really want to hear that. But I assume you're not you joining us. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. Um, I mean, I'm so, I, 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 I'm, so in awe of all the uh, leadership represented by the people on the stage today, and, and I feel like I'm really curious what, um, how people, like in those 10 times, like how, what role models did you have? Who did, you know, how did you, because I feel like I, I did have a lot of tenacity, but I also feel like, you know, one of the, one of the hardest things about sexism is that you're made to feel every generation that nothing really was accomplished by the generation mm -hmm. before you. And that you have to start from square one, you have to jump over this particular hurdle designed for your particular time, you know. And, um, and I knew, you know, I've known better through reading and through learning and listening and all kinds of heroes, you know, not, not only women, but I'm just, I, I wanted to maybe, I can I flip the, I was going just to ask a later question, but you can jump. Yeah, jump you know, maybe both Cecile and I, you know, specifically in music, when there weren't people saying, yes, you should do this thing, how, how, where did you find your sources of inspiration? Hmm. <laughs> so I sort of just wanted to address what Dominique's saying and then also just going into you know, here we are, it's like, this is a very artistic thing that I do in my life. Like, how is this gonna be like about business? The biggest question that I get also is like, what can you do with, I mean, it's jazz composition. You know, it's, it's like, what can you do with that? And so, 
for me, what I've had to do is to be very flexible. Almost like the number of times I've not, you know, I've not said no to something. Um, and you know, I, I now have like all of these projects, which are totally crazy while I'm also trying to teach, but there, was, there has to be flexibility. You have to understand um, your clients, you know, who you're writing for. And actually it's interesting because when I do other work and I make, you know, I make money from the other work, then that's to fund my craft because, sorry, my big band's not profitable. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, it's, it's, just a, it's just a way for me to keep going um, with the band. Um, the challenges have been, um, I think, you know, networking is really, really important, but the challenges generally I find, like, I'm not a very aggressive networker. I, I don't like doing that, and that's been a big challenge. And um, if we're talking about some of my peers or colleagues, um, and so to say, and I had to say that a lot of them are men who just, who just go for it and sometimes some clients prefer to deal with them, you know? Um, so so that's, that's within my world um, or, uh, you know, the way that um, things have been for me. And um, I also wanted to address something I said earlier was, you're talking about role models. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the things that I was lacking too, is like, here I am, this short Asian woman you know, and there was, I didn't see that, you know, I did not have that as a role model. And so, um, and so it wasn't, it's really interesting when I have students come to me and confide in me. So my thing right now, of course, is, is education, composition, orchestration, like all that kind of stuff. So, and one of the, the greatest people I think in the world right now is Terry Lynn Carrington. And I've been working with her on several different projects. And one of the most interesting things that she has done is put together, like she's putting together new standards um, book, lead sheets, compositions by 101 women. But one of the things she did in her, I think it's a Smithsonian article was to address the fact, like why do we picture jazz to be masculine? Like can something that, you know, what is the definition of jazz? Because it is a very sort of, in its history, like a very sort of like aggressive patriarchy type of a, um, genre and so as I was helping her and we're going through this book it was really interesting just the sort of the variety of tunes that we were going through with that um, so that's just something else to address it's just not um, it's not just like dealing with you know trying to figure out like how to deal with um, just being a woman within this industry but the history that exists with uh, before it and that it's there is a lot of patriarchy within it, and we just need to, I never want it to be like, I'm a woman in jazz. I never want it to be that. I just want it to be a musician. But I find that I can't just be that. Um, and then on the flip side, of course, you were asking about who we looked up to, and obviously for me, um, Bob Brookmeyer was my biggest mentor. Um, so, and it was really interesting because one of the things he said is he found that there was strength He's like, you're a woman, you know, you, you've got this. And I wish that was entirely true, <laughs> you know? But he just, he thought, he thought the world was like, like I could go for it because he thought that he's like, women are just so much stronger. So mm -hmm. I found that interesting. But then I had another friend, um, Jennifer Wharton, an Ethi alum, uh, based from Onus. And one of the things we were discussing is she's like, it's because you're a woman um, that you're not getting these things in New York. So, and she lived, you know, she's on Broadway, she lives in New York. So I thought that was really interesting, just sort of not matching up. Maybe I'll jump to a question that sort of addresses this. And maybe we could start with Cecile because Dominique wanted, I think, to hear you talk about this. Um, describe your experience as a leader in the often male-dominated field of music. Uh, who were your, your role, role models in that? Um, well, I think my number one role model was, has always been my mother. I was sort of born in, I don't think my dad would love hearing this, but I was born in like a very matriarchal society <laughs> even. I, I really, I, I really thought that this was 
generalized. Um, my last name is my mom's last name first. McLaurin is my mom's last name. Um, and we're not, you know, I, I think people do that in South America, but we're not, I mean, that's not our, we're, she's French, my dad is Haitian, it's not in necessarily in our tradition to hyphen like that, but even in my name itself, there is her presence um, first. <laughs> like she made, she made sure. Um, and she is somebody who, with absolutely no experience, with um, no uh, background in the field, founded a French school in Miami, um, which kind of grew over the years just based off a, a whim and an idea that she had by herself. She like took flyers and drove around Miami and just just asked anyone who wanted to you know, uh, enroll their kids. And I think the first year there were four kids and then it grew to something that I think now there's about 200 students and it's been, it's been going for, f for maybe 20 years now or more. Uh, so I've always seen my mother build things from the ground up with no experience and um, absolutely <laughs> no reason to do it. I mean, she would do carpentry, she made lace, she, um, she l literally anything that came to her mind, she would just say, all right, I'm going to learn it, I'm going to tackle it, and I'm going to do it. And so that was, for me, huge, just growing up with that kind of energy and that kind of fearlessness. Um, so I, don't, I don't remember the question. <laughs> Role yeah. models? Well... And also, you know, your experience as a leader in this. World. I'm not a. I, I don't think I'm a great. I'm not. I don't. I don't feel that I lead in in the, in the direct sense of the word. I wonder sometimes how much it's impossible. You know, Dominique was saying it's like it's impossible for me to extract how much of that has to do, with being uh, female identified or, uh, just my plain old personality, how much is my personality tied to my gender, all that stuff, I mean, who knows? I'll never know, but um, I'm, I'm very apologetic. I, I, it's, it's taken me years to really uh, express what I want. It's always, you know, maybe we could do this. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I'm probably wrong. Like, I'm, this is constantly me. In, in, in my bands, in my rehearsals, <laughs> um, in the studio. But there are other, I, I f I've found that I, I can only do so much against that inherent need to apologize and, and diminish myself. But there are ways in which I think I've, I've, I've found other ways to, I don't, even, I don't even know that I can say lead. <laughs> I, I've found other ways to just, um, to just bring ideas to the to the table, to the band, to to the musical setting, and a lot of that happens on the gig, and a lot of that is is improvised, and and um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I it's I think it's 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 a strange thing for me to think about because it's on the one hand, I I've always been very attracted to. Um, songs that deal with identity, that deal with gender, that deal with, with power dynamics and stereotypes and, and not just gender, but also race and, and that strange dance that those two things have together. Um, and, you, you know, fetishism and all of that stuff is in, in the songs that I pick. Um, so it's, it's something that I've always been interested in, but then I am female identified uh, doing something that, you know, is, I'm not breaking any ground by being a singer, <laughs> uh, being a black female identified person, uh, to the point where I remember going to jazz clubs in Paris and nobody knew me there. I was, I was a student in a conservatory. I was like 18, 19 years old and people like, guys would turn around and be like, you're going to sing, right? Because they just see like a black woman in, in, the, in the audience and they're like, you're, gonna, you're, you're a singer, right? And I'm like, 
yeah. <laughs> like, uh, so I'm not, I'm not being radical in that way. <laughs> Can I say something to that? Of course. Yeah. It's almost like the expectation that um, I'm going to write something pretty. Yeah, I'm always going to mm -hmm. have to write something pretty, or you know, or I can't swing. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, um, <laughs> so like I said, you know, I also am an immigrant. I'm from Singapore, and you know, <laughs> so <laughs> Asian women, yeah, it's, there was not that connection, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, yeah, so there was that sort of like, oh, you play the classical piano, you like, Pull out some Chopin, you know? <laughs> I used to at one point, but you know, it's like, yeah, I, I can swing. <laughs> Anyone else want to address that one? Andrea, I'd be interested in your, <laughs> maybe you don't feel comfortable talking about this, but. Yeah, sure, I'm gonna just come to peer pressure here and do it, so. <laughs> <laughs> Consistency. Um, actually, a lot of what Cecile was saying really resonated with me, um, you know, the, um, I grew up also in the Jokin family was it was a matriarchal society. I had um, my grandmothers were kind of incredible. One, both were in England. Um, if you can think of the shows, The Midwife, and then the book Angela's Ashes, like they were in those worlds. One was literally a district nurse and midwife, and you know, would tell these phenomenal stories about delivering babies and helping displaced persons during while bombs were dropping around. And I had this image of her biking, you know, and helping people while bombs were dropping around her, and it was a literal thing, right? Um, and the other um, had uh, her husband died right at the outset of the war, um, right months before my dad was born, and she had four kids in the slums in Birmingham, uh, London and then Birmingham, and kept everybody going, you know, which was sort of not done at that time. So there was this sort of strength of women, and my mom is, you know, the same way. Um, and I never questioned that, so I think um, I was fortunate to be able to sort of grow up in an environment that th there was never sort of a question that you could do what you needed to do, right? It wasn't even sort of overtly drilled into me, it just sort of was around me. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that, that um, kind of naturalness, which, you know, is, is a gift. Uh, so that sort of happened. Um, so they're, they're very distinct role models. In terms of you know, professional work, um, I, there weren't other women in leadership positions and it wasn't really an aspiration. Well, it wasn't at all an aspiration for me, uh, certainly to become president or even to become a dean or to, to be in anything. Um, it was just sort of being driven by the work and there weren't people around me who were women who were doing those things. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna be that. Um, but I think, um, more than role models, it was sort of inspiration and kind of learning to be had by the people around you, like whatever gender, um, where you would see somebody who was, that you had the opportunity to work with, who was driven by the work um, and cared for the people doing it um, and, would, and made everything better, right? And would sort of, you would learn from them. And so it's sort of those people, and there are some very, you know, very specific people that uh, hit me in formative times where, where uh, I think it was like, oh, I want to be like that, you know. So I want to emphasize that side of myself. Um, so yeah, so I think it's it, it was that as far as you know, and and sort of tripping into administration uh, along the way. Sort of, um, I think there's just a, a sense of how can you contribute? How can you contribute? And learning, like Cecile, much like what you were saying, is sort of learning to take who you were. Um, and use that in service of the thing that you were charged with doing. I don't consider myself a leader. My job is to lead an institution and to lead the people to do that. Um, and so, you know, I was a painfully shy kid. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody ever believes that, but I was. <laughs> um, uh, it was, you know, I am also quite self-deprecating. I, you know, there's, you fight with imposter syndrome every day, but your job is bigger than you. It's in service of something that's so much bigger than you and so much more important than you. And so you have no choice but to channel the things that you care about, your values, your, you know, your, your character, yourself, and um, use the people around you, and, like collaborate with the people around you to become better than you are in service of the thing that you're trying to, to achieve. Yeah. Um, Monique or Dominique, do you, either of you wanna? Address no, that no, question. No, no, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. I mean, I think it's really something um, 
uh, you know, great for, you know, just knowing, being in touch with the students all the time and, and how, how much people feel like they're gonna be perfect and then they're gonna do the thing that they wanna do and I hope it's just, you know, it's inspiring to me to, you know, think about, I don't know, I always tell my students what Julia Child said which was, never apologize, never explain. <laughs> I would be mute but I can't, <laughs> I can't abide. I can't abide, but I just think, you know, I was thinking of the other day, I was sketching something and I was like, nature is seldom perfect but it's always purposeful. And that really helped me because I think that's another trap you can fall into, you know, for sure. It's just that you got to get it all together, you know, and, and, you know, to say about those obstacles, you know, the obstacle course, you have to, you know, clear all these hurdles and then, you know, but it's, it's really, you know, a work in progress and, and, you know, it's stunning to hear these accomplished um, women attest to, to that, you know, and that, and that they've done so much without you know, without necessarily having to fulfill all the, you know, self-help back of the book <laughs> questions, <laughs> answer them perfectly. So, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks. I know, I, I'm gonna stop talking, but maybe not. <laughs> um, but like, you know, it's interesting just seeing like, I think sometimes I just like, I have to do this. If, if I don't do it, it's not gonna get done. And that's another mentality I think a lot of um, women tend to because it's like I can't stand like okay no one's taking care of this you know I remember when we were first at the first year of doing um, the NEC Jazz Composers Workshop Orchestra and back then Brooke Meyer would only come down like six times a semester no one was running it in between and like I just jumped in and I just jumped in and started and I remember one time I had to call this is before email we had to call like subs, you know, and run around like practice rooms looking for people to sub out. And then like I would organize a list of which composers would go when, because nobody, there was no actual, like we were supposed to run it ourselves. Then I ended up having, but only because I was like, it's not getting done, you know? So I think about the idea of like, I don't choose to be a leader. I'm just choosing to get things done is a, probably a really great mentality. And then the one thing I do want to say is currently for me, because I am you know, really engrossed in education, is I find a lot of inspiration from my students. Like I find that they are quite great role models because the other thing I so don't want is for them to go through some of the things that I had to go through. And so I'm trying to figure it out with them, I guess, you know, like, how can we make sure that we don't end up in the same paths that, you know, like you said, you know, obviously the no's and the rejections that makes them stronger, but that doesn't mean that everybody else has to go through that. The notion, sorry, jumping on, the, the notion of women sort of, um, that you kind of doing the things that need to be done, it, it does, I will say that the, the women I work with and have worked with throughout my career, it's have been incredibly inspiring in that sense. They almost always kind of just get it done. Uh, and, and people rely on them in, in those ways. And it's, it's really inspiring, right? And um, helps, I mean, you just, you just learn tremendously from that. So maybe I would just jump in. What came to mind in listening to everyone is uh, finding your voice. So while I'm an administrator, I wonder about artists and this process of finding voice. And I think, um, I actually also grew up in a matriarchal family, mother, grandmother, great grandmother. These were the people taking care of us when um, the male identifying or fathers were, were sort of not, not around. And so I saw that strength. Um, but also in my career, I've come to a point where I actually had a moment where I realized, wow, Monique, you actually have something to say. You know, the, and it's not always the right thing. It's sometimes it's the wrong, you know, it, it doesn't have to be perfect, but there's something in you that you've got to give the world. And there's something that you have to say and you've got to say it. And so I, I think I had to go through that process. And as part of that process, it was also becoming okay with when I fail. Sometimes I say the wrong thing. Sometimes I'm going to fail. I'm going to make mistakes. And um, I'll always be like, oh, I made this mistake. But it's also okay. And so it was sort of that navigation of, of finding voice and believing that I have something to say. And because I maybe went through that process and I'm still in process, I can see those voices in the people around me, sort of students or whomever we're working with, is that everyone has something 
beautiful and meaningful to say and so how do we create space for that to happen and i wonder what that looks like even artistically how do we come to voice whether it's artistically or in leadership or in admin okay thank you um so another question um because we have a lot of students in the audience uh, can you describe the steps that led you from your life as a student to your life as a professional and what advice would you give a student maybe a student is about to graduate and is trying to figure out what that next step is I'm here okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um well, interestingly enough, when I graduated, I ended up working for Ken. So that was my first job out of um, NEC and um, working um, in the jazz office. And so, but I did that in combination of, um, you know, it's weird, like, I, I guess I don't, it's hard to believe that I'm a professional, like, because I always feel like as musicians, there are lots of times where like, we're doing so many different things. Um, and so, being flexible, I think, is really, really important. Being willing to collaborate is really, really important. Not being like pigeonholed into like um, saying like, okay, I only write big band music or whatever. Um, but that would have been the thing for me. But I was like, yeah, whatever it is you want me to do, I'll give it a shot. You know, if I can, um, if I can figure it out, I will do it. And so, um, you know, just be between, just obviously like. But I also had my band that I started to put together and. It's been around, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but it's been around for 20 years. And um, <laughs> it's crazy. I, I know, I, I don't look that old. But, um, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, um, so we would meet weekly initially. Um, and so, I mean monthly, sorry, not weekly. And so in between doing that and just sort of like being like, hey, you know, um, uh, reaching old contacts, like whether it's old band directors or uh, people, it's like, hey, do you want me to like, write a piece for you, you know? and looking out for commissions. There's also the other thing, obviously I'm speaking to a specific group of people, but when you're of a certain age, that's a whole nother topic, by the way, um, but there's a lot of opportunities for people like 35 and under in all sorts of fields of music. So look for all of those different things. You know, the other thing too is like whether if you can be an intern. Um, you know, I, had, I did some copy work as well. Um, and then, you know, and then I got into education, so I was very lucky with that, and that my world kind of meets um, in that area. So um, I, I stopped, <laughs> I ended up having to still work as an administrative assistant after I left working for Ken part-time, but when I finally stopped that, I was like, wow, this is what I do for a living, and it was kind of weird, and I still think it's kind of weird, but, um, but I'm very, very lucky, I just feel like me being flexible was really, really um, the best way that I could do it. And, and, be, you know, and I felt also it was important. You, maybe you don't get along with everybody, and maybe not everyone's for you, but don't burn those bridges. You never know what's going to happen in the future. You never know when you're going to meet somebody again. And because you were just a little bit more kind at the time, you don't have to be like overly crazy, but just because a little kindness goes a long way, in my opinion. And the last thing is I surround myself with people that, um, that I would love to play with and who are positive and they've become family. And that's just the way that I roll. That's how it is for me. Um, I can't deal with people, you know, it just ruins the vibe of the band and the music. So um, they're all my family, basically. Emily, do you wanna tackle that one? Sure. I I, you know, I had a long undergraduate career. Um, I started out as an, an English major at Vassar. Um, and I was there for two years and I, I just, I mean, I played music constantly. I just never thought of it as a profession. It was almost like too close to me to realize. And I was in a band there. Um, Vassar at that time had gone co-ed and the women, the women were called the co-eds, which was weird. But anyway, um, I was in a band there called Naima and super cool and that's where i really started seeing um singing a lot with other people because i mostly played guitar and i was singer songwriter kind of stuff and um 
then I went to transfer to Berkeley. Actually, I came for a summer session to Berkeley just because I wanted to get my reading and writing skills together better. And I said, oh, this is, maybe I'm a, mu maybe I'm a musician. <laughs> I mean, you know, what would that be? And so then I decided to take a leave of absence from Vassar, and I did two semesters at Berkeley, the end of, of which I heard Rand Blake play um, at, in Harvard Square, and I was just like, you know, that's the logical next step of, you know, the music that I'm into, and so I came and finished my degree here. So I had six years, much to my parents, well, then they didn't give me too hard a time, but six years of undergrad. Um, and so I had a lot of time to think about what school was like in different places. And I, I think by the time I got here, I mean, I had already taken all my liberal arts classes at, at Vassar and I could really focus on music, but I also understood that schools create their own aesthetic, their own environment. It can be kind of the environment du jour, depending on you know the influential teachers or students. And so the thing I'd really say to people is, absorb that, like Ayn said, you know, connect with the people that you're in school with, because you're going, you know, my first gig in New York was at the Village Gate with John Medeski, who had actually been a student in one of my ensembles, you know. So, so you're gonna keep working with the people that are around you, but the aesthetic of the place that you're in is very temporal, and look beyond that as well in all the ways, as Ayn was saying, professionally networking, but also artistically. Um, I think that's really, really, really important. Yeah, I think that's really incredibly well put. Um, I went to school, I went to a music school in the southeast of France with one jazz teacher, and he was a saxophone player. Um, and he, I feel like the way that it was set up, there was not really a boundary between leaving school and being in, like it's, I, and I still very much feel like I'm a student. I mean, even walking through here, looking at the practice, I'm just, it doesn't feel that different from, I, I don't see that there's a transition really out, out of school it's all sort of the same thing. It's just more of the same, but different spaces. Um, and I, I just remember my teacher would um, never give us any prompts, never give us any homework, no exercises, nothing. He would just literally sit in the room and wait for us to do something every week. And so early, we never, it felt like we never really had a teacher in a way, but it was kind of, incredible because very early we were taught that we had to we had to fend for ourselves and we had to teach ourselves and we had to ask him questions and not wait for him to feed us but go and 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 get that so i think i think probably if if i were to venture out into giving advice it would be to not consider this like keep be in the mindset of of going and getting the information that you need and being active and engaged and not being passive and continue that on after you leave the school because you never do really leave the school. Um, I, I think that's, that's really been my experience and, and continues to be. Uh, I would actually continue on what Cecile said and maybe um, talk about mentors going after what, and the, the really great thing about being a student, or anyone really, is that as a student, you can pretty much go to anyone, right, and say, oh, you know, I wanna learn about your craft, I wanna learn about what you're doing, will you spend 30 minutes with me and do a coffee? And I've never been turned down with it. When I was still performing, I do it with many people, as I moved into leadership administration, all the skills, if you're someone who, 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 who's thinking of moving into that realm, um, all the skills I pretty much had to learn on the fly. You know, these are things we don't learn in music school. Um, and I learned so much of it through mentors and I still have a really key group of mentors in my life that I can go to and say, hey, I had a hard day. Um, or can you tell me about this in your, in your life or this in your practice? And so, and, and many of these people might be people you had NEC around you, you know, staff, faculty, colleagues of yours as students. 
uh, figure out who those mentors are and those connection points. And maybe one thing I can say is that almost every door that has, in a sense, been opened in my life through opportunities, whether it's work earlier on in performance or just the volunteer work, um, it's, it's been through people I know. So just similar to what everyone else has said, never underestimate the connection that you're making with someone because that person could very much be the person who opens the next door for you. And you will never know in that moment what is that next door and who's at that door who might say, hey, I think you, you might be a good fit to, to walk through this. Would you be willing to try? Uh, yeah, so network, mentors, and connection. Uh, yeah, yeah, I had a... a a uh, boss who used to say to students who would give advice to students as they graduate that um, treat everybody like the reference for your next job because they probably will be, right? Everybody <laughs> will end up being a colleague sooner or later. It's remarkably true how, how much it um, follows through. Um, I think I, just to kind of start with the advice, I guess, uh, I would just say um, follow, do work that you love, that interests you and that you love and don't be afraid of the work. Um, being something that you don't know how to do or too hard, you figure that out, right? Um, if you're following the things that you love doing and, you're, and you think you can contribute and you think you can, uh, and you care deeply about it, you'll figure out how to do it and how, how to get better. Um, and so never sort of be stopped by that. So uh, all of which to say, for me, I, I did not have the traditional five-year plan. I just kept doing things that interested me. I started out as a classical pianist. Um, uh, through that became, you know, was absolutely performance driven and, and then sort of discovered analysis and, and context and found that music history sort of brought all these things together that, that I was inclined to think about. Um, and so ended up moving into mu morphing into musicology um, and, you know, did, wasn't sure where that was going to end up. Um, I did have a professor literally pat me on the forehead, uh, you know, like this and say, well, you know, you may have a job in the profession one day, sort of thing. And I was watching these other guys next to me who I didn't think were any more driven or, or smarter necessarily, who were assumed that they were going to have a position in musicology. And so, so you just have to kind of keep going, right? But I loved it, um, and I found it fascinating. And so you sort of follow that, and that led to um, uh, the long way of getting a PhD <laughs> when I had a, two children in the middle of it. Uh, so it was a very circuitous route that you sort of keep going, and I was teaching a lot, uh, and never said no to a teaching gig, right? It was, um, uh, you know, can you teach medieval music, you know, on four days notice? Yep, I can do that, right? So, and you, you figure out how to do it, because you have responsibility to the people that you're teaching. So, so I sort of kept doing that. I had a, um, in the course of that, ended up with a full-time teaching job that was one-tenth of administration, because somebody it was supposed to be one tenth of administration, ended up really being two full-time jobs, um, and then had another opportunity to sort of move entirely into administration. And I was sort of at the point where I realized um, what I love doing, I love teaching, um, and what I also, but I also really enjoyed the, the administrative work and realized that not everybody did. There were a lot of really good teachers in the world. There weren't a lot of people who really passionately loved um, and felt they were contributing and could sort of take this approach to admin and so sort of ended up taking the plunge into the dark side uh, mm -hmm. and um, uh, ended up in administration. And then again, it's just sort of following what you, what you love um, and trying to make sure that you're contributing um, in your work as long as you're doing it uh, and then pushing to learn more. So, so just, I would follow what you love, it usually works out. I, I've never, students graduate, you know, there's always this panic um, during admission sessions amongst, you can see it in parents and you can see it in students. You go into an admission sessions and the students are there terrified they're not gonna get in, but they love this thing that they're here to audition for. And the parents um, really wanna support their students and they, they believe in the arts and they believe in their, their child and, um, and they're scared they're not going to be able to make a living and at the end of end of graduation Everybody does something the next day, uh, you know students do something they figure it out and they figure it out in ways as You all will and we all did in ways that are meaningful to you um, and um, um, and build your artistic voice and your person and your character and, um, and Enable you to sustain yourself and so if you follow that and are not afraid of what you don't know, um, and and you're really smart and thoughtful and humble about learning from the people around you, um, then you'll be fine. You'll be just fine. You'll be happy at least. 
So as you might know, we're streaming this, and we have a question from the streamer. Uh, yeah, the streamers, I don't know what you call them. And maybe I'll open this up to anyone. Um, how do you deal with feeling not heard, whether it's because of gender or anything else? could jump in. Uh, so I'm not an artist on the panel, I'm an admin. I think I would divorce the feeling from what you do. So the feeling of being heard is not cool <laughs> and it never will be great. And so somehow we've all got to navigate that feeling but despite the feeling we still speak up and we figure out how we do that. And so I think there's these sort of two parts of this is how we feel about the thing but I, I think in my experience, even when I'm shaking in my boots, if I know I need to say something, whether that's musically early on or in a leadership round, I'll still say the thing. And it actually in those moments, it doesn't really matter how I'm feeling about it. And I think that's how change happens, is navigating through the feeling to what do I do with this? But it's never gonna feel good when you're not heard. Um, yeah. Yeah. My problem, I'm my problem actually sometimes is that um, I'm expected to be heard more. So I actually mm -hmm. kind of have the opposite problem because um, it's feeling like you have uh, that you have something to say <laughs> that's of importance or, or value, right, of, of value. So, um, and being truly heard, I think. I think people do make assumptions about all the positions that we're in, right? So they take your, take your thoughts or make assumptions about you. And so it's that sense of communication. Um, communication is partly what you say or could, play or share and it's partly how it's heard and it's sort of constantly that, mm -hmm. that battle of trying to think about how those two intersect and how what control you have over making that communication um, flow more effective. Um, I'm just gonna, you know it's weird, I know maybe some of you may know me but I'm actually a very like shy person <laughs> and sort of introverted and so when I used to be in class, like whenever I'm in a new situation I tend to be the person in the back, I tend not to be saying a lot and but I find that, um, you know, as I listen around to others speak or, or something like that, and I want to say something, but I feel like I can't, um, that, that's a really hard situation. Um, but what I like to do personally, like I like to observe and listen and figure out the, what, what's going on in the situation. The other thing, and I'm going to say it, the other thing I've noticed if, if somebody just wants to talk and talk and talk and not listen, then it's just a, you know, you're just losing the battle anyway, because even if you say something, I feel like they're just not gonna listen to you. And so I think that's more the situation that is happening. So if it's not about not being heard. To me, it's more about like, you're not listening. I think it's more the situation that a lot of us have been in. If somebody's willing to listen to you, then, then I think we can be heard. I'll just I'll just quickly say that a lot of the the times I've felt completely misunderstood or not heard, I've ended up just throwing myself into writing a song about it or making a drawing about it or um, it 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 always comes out in some way. And I don't know if that streamer is uh, has has any kind of creative outlet, but. Uh, that's always an option. <laughs> so I know I said at some point we'll open this up for questions. Maybe this is a good time unless there's any, anything you guys want to add to what we've discussed so far. Um, I'm just going to add one last thing in the fact that, um, you, know, we, like, um, you know, we're talking about particularly in our fields, we never really quite leave school, so to say. Also, all the information that you get here, is, it's not been a very long time compared to like what your careers are gonna be. So you're just gonna continue to process that information. And so don't, don't, be, you know, don't be afraid of like, you're not getting it now. You'll get it. You know, if, if you really want it, you'll get it. And then I, I still remember like the first time like some, you know, like whether it was some sort of theory thing and then later on I'm like, oh, and it's like three years later. So. Um, that will happen. I mean, and even like I had to do this orchestration, you know, recently, and I'm like, I forgot how to write for heart. <laughs> it's been many years, so I had to 
go back and relearn. So you're always learning. So that's something that is part of our process. So I guess there is a mic here that you can use if you want to, I guess, be heard on this stream. Laura, maybe you can help us with that. experiencing something that maybe your colleagues that don't mm -hmm. menstruate <laughs> experience, they don't experience, or childbirth or those things that affect you in a way where you feel like you need to slow down and you need to rest, but your career is calling on you to sacrifice that time. How do you balance? I did my first record for RCA, um, the schedule of which was organized around my nursing schedule for my first son. <laughs> so I think you have to make it work. And, you know, luckily, um, I remember my primary care physician saying to me, and she was kind of, you know, kind of straighter, 50s, you know. And I didn't know what to expect when, when I was talking to her about, you know, that I was pregnant and I got signed to RCA <laughs> at the same time. And she said, your babies are very portable, which I thought was wonderful. And it, and it turns out they were, I did, I made, <laughs> I did all the arranging for, for the record, you know, during the pregnancy, had the baby, went to New York with the, because we had moved back to Boston at that time. And I went back to um, New York to record um, and, and was, you know, had my son with me, my husband came with me as well, and um, and it, it was, and then I went out and promoted the record to the degree that I could um, with the baby, and I made it work. You know, I, I took the baby to Paris, I had a sister, two sisters that lived in Europe, and they came and nannied for me, you know, so, so that doesn't have to do with the very specific <laughs> thing that you're saying, but it, but it, does speak to the larger thing, which is there's this, can be this dynamic that says, you know, what you go through naturally is unnatural to the working world. And I just always, you know, that one little moment where, where my primary care physician said that to me, it didn't mean that I then had to pack my babies everywhere and, you know, do everything. I, I strove to, to find a balance myself, but but I think it's the same thing with all of the changes that you go through, you know, that, that you know, there's a rhythm to every person. Um, and, and, you know, you have, to, you have to recognize the naturalness of that and, and kind of resist the feeling that, um, that some other system that's set up is more natural than what your body is telling you, I think. Too. And I think there's I, and there's a strength in that, right? That so it doesn't actually solve the problem, but there is a, a strength in it down the road because you can figure it out, right? Yeah. You you do, and you can draw on that strength in other ways. So I think it's you know well, you do it, right? You work through it, you figure it out. And I just have a thought, you know, I I've, I've never had children, but I want to maybe move the conversation into mental health, and that's been something for me linked to trauma, linked to many things around I'm a physical being, <laughs> I'm working, I'm, I'm this and that, but I'm also, I need to be mentally and emotionally healthy. And so there's been moments when I've had to stop myself saying, Monique, you can't work 16 hours a day. You need to stop, you need to eat, you need to do all of these things to function and to be fully here. And I remember my dad sitting me down saying, Monique, you just sleep more. I said, no, but I'm quite fine. My work's quite fine without sleeping as much. He was like, but imagine what you would be if you did sleep, you know? <laughs> So I think t being okay with those moments of breathing and doing what we need to do to take care of ourselves. It's, it's okay to take care of yourself. It really is. Yeah, I was going to say it's, um, it's important to allow yourself um, just time, you know, because you can't, you can't create your art, you can't go about your passion without being in a, in a good place for yourself. doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. Sometimes, you know, there are times you have to plow, like I keep telling everybody, I can't wait till June, um, you know, and that sort of a thing. But I think, but allowing yourself just, even if you can find like even little times of day or one time in the week, I tell my student, I'm like, okay, this is your homework for the weekend, with other homework, by the way. But I'm like, 
with, but I'm like, I also want you to do this other thing. And they look at me in horror. I'm like, I want you to take one hour and do something for yourself that you enjoy and not, you know, what, whatever that may be. And so the, the mental health thing is such a big deal and that will contribute towards your physical health as well. Um, and so that's, that's, that's truly important. So you can't, you can't function if you don't take care of yourself too. And you'll figure out how to do that. I'm just curious what artistic and career aspirations you all have that you haven't realized yet. Um, you know, because we're all excited about new things. Maybe they're outside your comfort zone. They could just be conceptual. But I'm just curious. Um, I'll jump in. Um, I d I'm trying. I'm really. And I'm a broken record with this, but I'm really trying to make this movie. Um, <laughs> trying to make a movie. <laughs> Streamers out there. Um, that's, that's a huge challenge because it's animation. Um, I, I do a lot of drawing. Uh, so I'm working, I'm, I'm directing it. I'm co-directing it with, with this woman in Belgium. And so we're sending drawings to each other and it's, uh, it's a big challenge because it's networking, which I don't do and don't know about. It's fundraising, which I don't do and don't know about. And then it's also like directing. So it's a whole bunch of challenges in one. Um, I sort of am actually doing this a little bit more now because mainly for me it was big band writing and composing and doing my stuff. And so um, I'm branching out from that recently. Actually, this is a wonderful project with the doctoral student from um, Arizona, and she wanted to commission a bunch of um, duets because um, she's a classical saxophonist, and, but she also wanted to make sure that, you know, there's always this myth about not being able to improvise and the myth of, you know, um, like a lot of, it's really interesting, but a lot of women started out on Barry sax, that was something else too, and she was mentioning, and then so she wanted it to be with something that's not scary, that's also possible in the classical world. Um, and so that was one project that I did. And then I'm doing like more orchestration and it's just working on a Nat King Cole Christmas with Terry Lynn Carrington. So that's really, really fun. Um, and, but it's not anything that I normally do because it's a very sort of more commercial type of thing. It's, it's like on the opposite end. And then I want to collaborate. Um, there's a wonderful artist, her name is Claire Lim, and she's, um, she does EDI type of thing, so, but she'll sample live, and then she'll also do like beats and stuff, and then, so I thought it'd be really crazy if I could get the big band and her, so she'll like sample the big band, but then she'll trade with the big band, and then, um, obviously I have a lot of time on my hands right now, and then the last thing, project, and this is actually really interesting because a few years ago, um, my band, we, were, we went to New Orleans, and we took a photo, and um, you know, I'm standing in front of the band, and this woman, uh, this colleague of mine, she says, where are all the women in your band? I was like, I have, um, you know, other than Kathy, who played Barry, and it was just sort of like, well, I've known these people for 20 years. These are the people that are around me. These are, I wasn't like picking and choosing, I had, male colleagues, that was what was available to them. And so, you know, but, and we've grown as a band. And so it was like, but it was also like, I'm, I'm the one leading it, so, you know, it, it, it didn't make me feel good. And then, um, so then I was like thinking, it's not like I'm gonna create a big band of women. So my next project is I wanna do like a bunch of little, like collaborations, and do like a whole album of different sort of instrumentation. But it's the idea that, I'm, you know, that I can do other things other than them write big band, other than just write jazz. And so that's, that's my goal, and really to just sort of create like these, like the, these different groups. So I think it could be something really fun. Okay, another question? Yes, I have a question. So I'm wondering um, 
how do, how do you deal with situations where you feel self-conscious about your own composition or like just improvise improvisations with when you're playing with people you're not familiar with? Because hmm. yeah. I'm very sensitive to people's comment when I felt afraid of, of like that situation I can't sing or improvise as what I wanted to. Me too. <laughs> I don't know. It's hard. I'm still working on it. How, how do you do it? Yeah, I mean, part of it, kind of what I was saying about finding people that you feel good playing music with, it's unpredictable. You know, you don't really know till you play, and you know, there's one, you know, you could set a goal for yourself really to feel kind of resilient in any situation, but at the same time then you maybe file away some important sensitivities that you have that make your music good. So um, I think the, 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 another way to do it, you know, is to be resilient when you have to be, but also really find those cherished, wonderful people to play with. I was really, really lucky when I first moved to Boston Alan, the great drummer Alan Dawson was still living and, and played with me and played my songs and played my arrangements. And I, I'm not going to say I took it for granted because, I mean, I loved, you know, Jackie Byard and Ross on Nolan Kirk and I loved those records and here was, you know, Alan Dawson, you know, playing. I was kind of, you know, my arrangement of out of this world or whatever. It was, it, it was remarkable to me then, but, but it also just gave me, it was really just, Let's meet on this task of making music together. And the people that I've played with who have given that to me and met me there, it's just, you just then know the difference. You know, if somebody's going to be vibey or, you know, it's just sort of like, well, what, you know, it's a, a bit like what Monique was saying of just, you separate the, you, I mean, you, you, you can't not be sensitive. You're going to feel the input of things, and sometimes it's important. Sometimes it might be something to hear, you know, you don't want to not, you know, you don't want to sort of ha have armor on and not engage, and, but, but, um, but, but you know the difference, you know, and that's a good thing to remember, you know, is you know the difference of a good conversation mm -hmm. with somebody and, and not so great conversation, and I think it's very similar in music, so, so gravitate toward those people that give you that and allow that for you to experience that. You know, and, and when, you ha when you're in a situation where you have to be resilient, set your own goals for that situ situation. Thank you. Yeah. And I would just add one, one statement is um, knowing when to let something go. You know, so knowing when it's something, similar to what Dominic is something I need to take and work on, and that's hard, and I just sit with it. But then also knowing, okay, I heard this thing, it's painful, I didn't like hearing it, but I, I'm going to let it go. And I think that's the hardest thing, whether it's artistically or just in life. It's just like, okay, I'm going to let this thing go. Mm -hmm. yeah. And knowing when to do that and what to do that for and having that conversation with self. And I'm just going to add and say that also know that there are a whole pile of classical pianists out there who are in awe of you for getting up and doing any of it at all because we know we can't. So. <laughs> about because I like the conversation like I was mentioning earlier about kind of like not like really making sure that you're kind to people and like and making sure that you're not like burning bridges I guess and then there's also this element of I guess like making music or even kind of around music um having conversations that are uncomfortable or making music that makes people uncomfortable and I guess I'm just like really curious to hear your thoughts on that and like and balancing those two things. I think like especially with Cecile, like you make a lot of music that <laughs> that um that like that like that can like actively does kind of try to bring these like uncom uncomfortable like conversations to the forefront. Um, and so yeah, I guess yeah, I'm just kind of curious to hear your thoughts and like how to hold that that balance. Well, I would say it, it kind of links back to 
to something that was said earlier about, actually I don't even remember what was said, but about being afraid to, uh, to say stuff or being very apologetic and, and being afraid to lead and, and not, sometimes not feeling heard and how do you feel heard when, you know, how, how, what do you do if you don't feel heard? And I, I think for me, the way my personality is, I'm extremely non-confrontational in life. I'm very afraid to speak my mind in, in conversation with people. I don't tell people when they've gone too far. I don't, I'm not great at setting boundaries. I kind of just shy away from situations. I'm, I'm, extre I'm overly sensitive. And so it's, it's almost like singing becomes, or, or p picking the songs becomes the outlet. It becomes the, the, the space where I can actually say extremely nasty things even and be mean. <laughs> and like, it's, 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 a, it's therapeutic to me and it's, 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 uh, it's the way I let all of those, those things out and it makes it a very potent experience for me. And, and I think it's probably why I like to choose those songs because I would never say those things in life, <laughs> you know. I would maybe just add to that from the, just maybe in leadership or admin and having uncomfortable conversations because my work is in diversity and inclusion. A lot of that sometimes includes uncomfortable conversations and I've had to do a lot of work with not being comfortable with the uncomfortable because who's comfortable in the uncomfortable? <laughs> but being okay with the discomfort. Saying, okay, Monique, you got this. This is uncomfortable, this is awkward, but you still gotta say this thing or you're still gonna do this thing. So in a sense, sitting Instead of running from, we do so much in life running from stuff. We run from the pain, we run from the discomfort. And instead of that saying, whoo, you know what, if I sit in this discomfort, I'm probably not going to die. I'm going to be, I'm going to live. It's going to be hard, but I'm going to live. So actually jumping into it and, and, and once we sit, whatever that looks for you artistically, just sitting in it, we find that there's sometimes beauty in it. And that's, that's been my experience. If I can just sit a little, something will come out of that. Yeah, that yeah, that was great. I mean, I, I you know, the thing about it is like being comfortable being uncomfortable I think is the biggest thing and that's how you're gonna be able to start the conversation. Or the same thing with music. Um, I, I do have to tell the story. Do you remember it was the funniest situation, Hell Crook, Bob Brookmeyer playing in Jordan Hall. Um, they're known for you know, Bob is known for playing like all these fluid, beautiful lines and standards and everything like that. And so we had an audience that came in expecting to hear Bobby Brookmeyer, as he was known, with Hal Crook and how exciting, these two legends on trombone. And Bob and Hal brought electronic, you know, they, they plugged their trombones into harmonizers. They were doing like free stuff. And there, it was just like new stuff. And then people walked out, right? Walked out of these two legends. And Bob said to the audience, he's like, it's a good thing when the audience walked out because you're doing something different and something new. And so, you know, sometimes you just have to do it and not be afraid. And the people who want to gravitate towards that, who want to start the conversation, will do that with you. And like, and then, you know, then you can continue that journey on. Any other questions? I don't want to. Hi. Um, I, was, I was kind of wondering, I'm sure you guys have all worked with like negative people, obviously, but um, <laughs> I was wondering if you had found like in a professional situation, has there been a difference when you've been working with like an all female band or like an all female group versus working with like a co ed situation? We're all very, we're very kind <laughs> with each other. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I can't give a scientific answer. <laughs> I can't give an objective answer 
that would answer to, you know, female versus male bands, uh, because I, that would be taking out, like, that would mean forgetting about everyone's individual personalities. And so, ha extremely hard to say whether one band acted, was a certain way because of the personalities of the people or because of the genders. Um, what I will say is that it's always great to have, for me, to, to be in a situation where there's like difference and where, where you know, there's different genders, different sexual orientations, uh, different religious backgrounds, different languages. Um, that to me is, is, has been some of the most exciting, um, exciting, it's, it's been some of the most exciting moments I've had on tour. Um, but yeah, I will, I will succumb to that idea that I have toured with one all-female band, Artemis, and yeah, there was something, there was something there in the vibe that was just really, really fun and really comforting and really, ah, I don't know. So I've just contradicted myself. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but I wouldn't I wouldn't want to to just you know pick a band based on that. I mean, I've been in bands where I've been the only woman, but I've also been in bands where I've been the only black person or the only American person. And so there's always something. There's always like a community that you that you fall into. I mean, it just depends on which one it is. I mean, I, I remember I was touring in France. When I started out, I was touring in France. I was the only like native English speaker in the band. And then suddenly I was with Americans years later and that felt like, oh, that's an interesting, now I feel an interesting, different kind of community. So, so I don't know. The Venn, the Venn diagram is always interesting. You could be in an all female band and feel like you have absolutely nothing in common with, I mean, you know, you've, you've been around women. <laughs> Sometimes you're like, I, none of these people, I, I can't talk to any of these people. So, who knows? I mean, I will say that when it's something that's put together by the industry for the purpose, yeah. can feel really different than the organic <laughs> desire. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's like if something's put together for the wrong reasons, right? That's, that's how you feel. Then you feel, is this more token? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I think if it's something that's more organic or something that you've done, like you put together or or that sort of a thing, and it's then it then then it's definitely more worth it. So I think we're coming up to the time we're supposed to finish up here. Uh, so any final comments or questions? We should probably get it in. But thank you, Laura, for your help facilitating. Yeah. Another question? Okay. Yeah. Hi. So I came in a little late, so I'm not sure if this is already talked about. Um, but I was wondering, because you feel I think your art is, your visual art is so cool. Mm. And as someone who like has a lot of different interests that like span out of just music, like how do you balance those different creative practices? Like, I mean, schedule wise, like emotional wise, like, you know, I'm just curious about your practice in general. Um, and how you support that. Uh, thank you. Um, I would say that a couple things. I'm obsessed with people's daily routines and with rituals and 
I like obsessively look up every artist's daily routine that I can get my hands on. I have those daily routine books by Mason Curry. I'm obsessed with Twyla Tharp. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to perfect my routine and make it like the ideal one and it's never gonna happen. <laughs> but um, I would say that I try to set up my day so that, uh, to, to be quite frank, I actually start with music and then I do visual art later in the day, in the afternoon, because other, if I didn't do music first thing in the day, I wouldn't do it at all, because I don't want to practice ever. <laughs> so I have to start with that and then do the drawing, which to me is, is like playing. And I'm really, really trying to, I'm trying to like find a way to remove all of the boundaries that I have created in my mind between visual art and music, between improvisation and composition, between interpretation of a standard or a cover and doing my own originals. Um, like I'm really, really trying to find a way to make everything into this one giant soup of just expression. And, and for me, drawing is, is, drawing and embroidery in particular are sort of central to that because I have retained the childlike element of play in that and only in that. In music, it's, it's complicated because there is a little bit of expectation, there's an audience, there's a band. Uh, when I'm drawing, I'm by myself, I'm self-taught never went to school for it, don't know what's right or wrong, and nobody can judge me. And so I'm trying to infuse that vibe to the rest of it. Um, and so it's actually been helpful to try to stop categorizing. I mean, I'm also, you know, I think we all do it. We're also always categorizing genre. What is this? Is this classical? Is this jazz? And I'm just really trying to trying to forget about, about all of those boundaries. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it answers so much. <laughs> Thank you. You sound great, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, um, again, coming back to, to creative process and um, um, leading, and, um, and as, I, as much as I get in, into composing more and more and um, play with, with other musicians, um, I realize that sometimes um, I write very specific and um, maybe I, I write even too much, too much information I put on into paper considering that we're more, mm, the musicians that I play with are very creative and um, have their own voice. And sometimes I'm scared to limit themselves with my ideas too much. And um, even when leaving the band, I often, uh, I'm very specific. I really want to hear certain things. And I'm very self-conscious sometimes that I want my ideas. I, I expect certain things maybe too much. Um, and I wonder how, you know, um, what's your process? And I, if you know, if you're here in Sizzle, would love to know what you think about this. Um, what's the right balance or, or, or when do you need to kind of step back and, and, and let others to, to you know, your creative, give their voice into, into what your creation. Um, I, I would say that the beauty is that you can try both things. I mean, you can, you can come in with your idea and try your idea and say, this is exactly how I want it to sound. And this is how, this is, this is what I'm hearing. And then 
re maybe record that, listen back to it, whatever it is. But then you can also say, hey, what what would you guys do on this? If if I gave if if I have no instruction and maybe you'll 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 learn something, you'll you'll find something that, that the band does that is interesting. I mean, I think uh, I think I mean this is something we talked about yesterday a little bit is like it it's never fully written. It's it gets written, it gets done every time it's performed. So you should you should do it all. I'm a maximalist. Do do all of it. Do do your version and then do their version and and uh, actually, the the best thing would be to have even another singer sing your songs, mm -hmm. and not you don't even sing it at all, mm -hmm. and hear how they do it, you know. And and I think that's truly the only way that a song like blossoms and gets its its wings is when someone else entirely does it and puts their stamp on it, and it's that's an extremely moving thing to 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 witness that see somebody else arrange, rearrange your song, and even, you know, do something completely out of, uh, like, totally unexpected with it. So I would say do all of it. That's, that would be my advice. But don't shy away from your specific ideas. Do those too. I think it's also really um, helpful to go watch other people rehearse, or if you are a side person in other people's bands. The cultures can be radically different. I mean, I've been in a side person in a band <laughs> where people are obsessing about, you know, one chord forever and ever, but all this other stuff, like I'm at first going like, ah, oh, you know, geez, I'm not getting paid for enough for that. But I'm realizing there's a whole nother thing at play that's going on that's creating some cohesion with the group. And so I really do love to see how different, when her palm boy taught, at Berkeley, I would just go watch him rehearse the student projects. You know, like how does he quickly decide what needs to be rehearsed? And what's, what I would say was really important for me to learn is that you can have a point of view and you can write really specifically, but you can also try stuff up, out and make a decision in the moment. And sometimes I think we write really, really specifically because we're afraid to try the thing out in the moment. And we were actually afraid of Will I know, well, like, like this morning in rehearsal, I was like, I'm not gonna like Anna playing Arco on this. It's definitely gonna be, but let, let's try it. And I was like, mm, okay. And she, yeah, so, you know. So, so it's really good. I, I mean, I would say that that's a women, woman's leadership kind of thing that you might not get to experience that often, to, to have a point of view, but it can also be open to other people's points of view. And that goes to, I think the, the um, live stream question of what do you do when you're not heard doesn't mean that you c completely control the situation or, you know what I mean? Like, you, I think it's, you know, I worked in a band where, where I was co-leading with another woman and, and we couldn't make a decision about, again, another uh, an ending chord and one of the people just said, decide something. I was like, oh yeah, C be definitive, even if you're not right, find, you know, See trial and error, and and if it's not right, you'll, you'll you know, you know. And even if you are you don't know, that's okay too. You know that I think can create some flexibility in in the exchange that goes on when you bring the music. I mean, I'm curious to hear what I has yeah, to say I, about that. I was going to say something, and you know, I, I agree. It's like having other people play your music actually allows you um, the the separation. Composition is a really really difficult thing because it's so personal. It's one thing when you're like working on your instrument and you know, and someone says, you didn't play that scale right, or you're dragging, you don't take that personally. But if somebody were to like, you wrote something and they start to make comments, because it, it's so personal. And that's when, if you, for me, because this is something that I have to do, is I separate myself. Brooke Meyer used to say, take your ear and put it on the table. Like you're separating yourself. Um, and so therefore you can and figure out whether or not um, it, it's something that you want, you know, and, and try different ways of going about it. And then the other thing too that helps is after you've written something, step away from it. Mm -hmm. Give it time because I've written stuff where I was like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And a week later I'm like, I wrote that, that sucks. <laughs> you know, so 
and, or, you know, oh, wow, that, okay, that still works. Because sometimes you need to give it time. When something is very new and shiny, it's hard to be objective about it sometimes. And so uh, it really, really helps just for a second. Like, all right, I need to give time. I need to get away from it. You know, it's like, um, and so therefore, that will help. And like having other people perform or having other people collaborate. And, and don't be afraid, you know, do it all. The more you do it, the more comfortable you'll be with it as well. And that's the other thing is you'll feel, you'll still feel self-conscious. Like never lost that, that's for sure. <laughs> but, but then you'll be like, okay, I'm not comfortable. I'm self-conscious, but I've dealt with it before. So it's not as scary. So I can do this. So I, th I think that will help. Well, maybe the last call. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Thank you all for participating, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>